Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lemastersmith. Each episode of this podcast, I talk with a guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search for stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are, pl- are latent in our rural communities. My guest today is the Reverend Johnny Norton. He's a former student and now a friend and colleague. Johnny is a retired licensed local pastor in the Western North Carolina Conference, serving at First United Methodist Church of Stanley as the Minister of Connections. He is a former, like I said, he's a former student and colleague. We've, he's had me to his churches to teach all kinds of classes. He's taken rural ministry classes, Methodist studies classes with me, a whole bunch of stuff. He's been really great to work with. We actually were appointed near each other for the past six months, and he got a shift in appointments as part of, as part of the way Methodists work. But first, we start each week off with a country music recommendation about rural life. This week, we're reaching back to what I believe is a 1936 recording. We're leaning on the bluegrass side of country music with My Long Journey Home by the Monroe Brothers. Now, I'll admit, the first version of this song I actually heard was Miko Marx, which is an African-American, soulful, powerful sort of version of this song. But any of the versions I've heard of this song, and I've heard three or four, are just these passionate things that make us think about life and faith. And it feels like this song is just about the journey of life. A life that it, sometimes it feels like it's like it's got the best of you, and yet there's something there. The song begins, There's black smoke arising, it surely is a train. Surely is a train, boys. Surely is a train. There's a black smoke arising, and it surely is a train. And I'm on my long journey home. The lyrics continue with losing all their money but a two dollar bill cloudy in the west and it sure looks like rain and then the rain comes and life seems to get harder and yet they have so much longer to go for me this song feels like it it's about the journey in life that is full of grief and loss and changing directions and long drives in the middle of the night when you're trying to get home or even just going through that long trek of trying to finish a degree or get through a sickness or a treatment program or that long time period where you're caring for someone in need who really can't pay you back. That sort of long journey that keeps going, it feels like it's never going to end. I mean, the train in this instance can be good or bad. The train could be something that picks them up. Uh, it's one of hope that, that catch a ride on their journey and just ride it to their next destination, shortening their trip if they can catch it. And in some cases, the train is a mode of getting out of poverty, thinking of people taking the train out of their small rural town to the city for opportunity. But in some cases, and often in country music and bluegrass, trains can be signs of death. The black smoke of the train that comes to take us off from this world a reminder of the long journey home that might be a different journey than we expected. Now, the songs I pick on this podcast are supposed to be about hope, right? So I want to explain myself. Like, this song feels like it's one about loss and death and struggle. But the thing is, every time I've heard this song played, you have to listen to the music. Even though it's a song about a long, sad journey, it's got a powerful rhythm to it a power whether it's a super fast bluegrass song a soulful powerful blues soul side of country feeling or a country song that's just got these got these beautiful high notes that have a sense of hope about them even when the song is sad it's a reminder that even though they're on a long journey their journey isn't over so they can still make it home like always i'll add this to our rusty water towers playlist on spotify so now let's get to know our guest, and to get to know our guest, we always ask them about the song. So welcome to the podcast, Johnny. What's your experience of this song? Well, uh, one of my uh, parishioners was uh, took the train home from World War II. Uh, he was a uh, gunner on a B-17, and he oh, said wow. when he, he got back stateside, he, he hopped on a train, and he, he just said, I just hope I can get home. He said... Mm. I kept traveling and traveling and eventually ended up in Lincolnton and before he got off, off the train. And wow. he said, you know, it was just a journey. Uh, he had spent two years over overseas in, in a prisoner of war. He oh, was wow. shot down over Germany and, and he was just glad to be home. And, wow. and that, that song, you know, kind of reminds me of his his story of, of traveling back home, his journey back home. That's that's beautiful. And the cha- I mean, just being a prisoner of war after a long and painful war that he made at home. 
yeah. and got off that train in Lincolnton, which is just not far at all from where he lived. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. So now, now that we have your your take on the song and your experience and what this song brought to mind for you, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, about your ministry, about country living, about growing up rural, uh, serving in rural churches, whatever you'd like to share with us. Well, uh, I haven't been a minister that long about about four years. God called me one night in a dream, said, "Go serve my people." Uh -huh. I immediately went to my pastor and said, I, "You know, this is what I've got to do." And he said, "Well." Uh, start your journey. And that's what I did. And a year and a half later, I became a licensed local pastor. And I came home off of vacation. The superintendent said, I, I've got an appointment for you if you want to take it. The bishop wants to try you out up in Vail. It's a three-point charge. I went to Vail and my senior pastor, I was supposed to learn from her. A week later, she had a stroke and I was on my own for the next two and a half years. Mm. 9, 10, 11 o'clock at all three churches. Now, these were rural churches. These people, each church basically signify a family, a unit. Mm -hmm. One or two families control the whole church. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you lost the family, you lost the church. And, it, and you know, it's just rural. You know, I grew yeah. up in a rural atmosphere and on a farm. Uh, me and my brothers, I got two brothers, one older, one younger. When mm -hmm. school was out, my dad packed us up and sent us to Tennessee to work on the tobacco farm. Mm. My, my grandmother used to cook a big country breakfast, and when she got through, she says, grab a biscuit. When you pass the garden, get you a tomato. That's going to be your lunch because we're going to be in the field all day long. And mm. that, that's the way the people are up in Bell. They, you know, they farm. Uh, they stay in the fields and I mean, it, it's big farming now. It's, it's you know, the soybean and uh, crops and the cotton and mm, all yeah. that. But it, it's still, you know, waiting for the seed to provide, waiting for the harvest. Oh, to yes. That's, that's basically what it is. They have to learn patience because they can't do anything until that seed, you know, grows. Mm. And uh, one unique thing about living up there af after the service there's usually one or two with five gallon buckets full of, you know, when the garden comes in, you got green beans, you mm -hmm. got cucumbers, you got squash, you got your Sunday evening meal ready, or you got to go home and cook it. Oh, exactly. I started I started at two churches very near where Johnny Johnny was, and I got the same experience. I would go visit church members and leave with fresh okra or squash or fruit from the local orchards because I had church members who related to people who ran the orchards. And it was just this amazing thing. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm going to miss the fried bologna and tomato sandwiches. I, <laughs> Ooh. That, especially using Duke mayonnaise. It, That's uh, a rule, yeah. yeah it, <laughs> it, can't be a, it can't be a mater sandwich unless it's Duke mayonnaise. Oh, uh, exactly. And the local restaurants that always had such good food, too. And the people, oh, yeah. the people will find you at these restaurants. That's so good. Yeah. And usually those restaurants are, are run by uh, people from my church. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, just yeah. until just recently, Northbrook Family Restaurant was one run by some of your church members, and he sold it because yeah. he was yeah. he was Carol retiring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. And then you've got uh, Norman's. That, you know, oh, yeah. I go to Laurel Hill and, and also uh, Redbone Willie's. That that's Laurel Hill also. I feel like Cat Square Restaurant's the annex for uh, my two churches. That if you go there, you're likely to see some of my church members are eating, no matter what time of day it is. <laughs> a, a, a funny story that we had in our Mission 14, where Methodist churches get together, mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to rename it this year, and and the district renamed it, you know, Tri County. Mm -hmm. And my people in the church says. Pastor Norton, you can't name it Dry County Mission because that's the beer joint down the road. <laughs> so we had to quickly change it back to Mission 14. <laughs> so, yeah, that's funny because there is that one beer joint out there. Yeah, but it's got great hamburgers. <laughs> I've heard that. No one's volunteered to take me yet. So yeah, it, it's great hamburgers. We'll see. We'll see. Ah, goodness. Thanks for sharing a little bit about yourself, Johnny. What we're going to do is take a short break, and then we'll come back, and I want to ask you to share one or two stories about your ministry and the rural life that you've experienced in ministry. So we'll be back after these messages. Hi there. Jonathan here, and I'm recording this ad to tell you about a resource from the Hinton Rural Life Center. 
My wife, Shannon, and I have partnered with Hinton to create the Theotokos Connections Confirmation Curriculum for small rural churches. We designed this curriculum with rural youth programs in mind, where you really want to connect their teenagers with the culture, heritage, and place on top of the faith you're trying to instill through the confirmation program. There are six sessions that focus on topics like connecting to self, God, history, church, place, and creation. Each unit has either a Bible story, like the story of Mary or the story of Samuel, or a historical figure like Richard Allen or Harriet Tubman to engage with as part of the experience. But this experience is not just a sit and listen and do a paperwork kind of confirmation. It's an active and connective confirmation program. You might be headed to a museum, helping prepare for a church spaghetti supper, learning new prayer practices, assisting in worship, or volunteering at the local mission agency. It is designed with rural culture and rural life in mind. You can do this in six weeks, six months, and you can do them in most any order or form you want to engage. And I'll tell you, I, I'm pretty sure it's not just youth programs using this curriculum. I've seen other people get it for their college ministries, as well as perhaps using it as adult confirmation or adult refresher on Methodist and rural culture and life. And you know, if you have other trusted confirmation curriculum you want to pair it with, go ahead. This is a very customizable program. So if you wanna bring other lessons from a different program you've used or things you've written yourself, feel free to blend them in. This is also a very affordable program and you pay per student, not for a lump sum curriculum that you may not use all the pieces of, or you may not use but once every two or three years. And this is designed to make it affordable and accessible for you. And it pairs well with Hinton's Theotokos confirmation retreats that happen in the spring. For more information on the curriculum or to place an order, check out hintoncenter.org slash theotokos or hintontheotokos.org for more information. Thanks. All right, so welcome back, everybody, and uh, welcome back, Johnny. We're going to just give you the floor and let you tell some stories about rural ministry, where you found hope in that rural ministry, where you had success, where you struggled, whatever you want to share with us. I'm, a, well, I'm open for you. My listeners are open to hear. Yeah, well, the three churches that I, I had was David's Chapel, Hebron, and uh, Laura Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, David's Chapel basically sit out in in a cow pasture. Oh yeah, I've been by. It's been there since the 1700s. It was rebuilt in the 40s, uh, Rick. Uh, out in the cemetery, you'll see grave sites of uh, Civil War soldiers and, and that sort of thing. And along that road, there's about a two mile road before it hits 27. All those people on that road go to that church. And the past three and a half years, about 30% of them, I, I've had to do their, their funerals. And and that's the sad part of the rural church industry because they're they're age, aging out and 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 dying out, and there's not many young people coming, and because all the young people are getting educated and moving away. Oh yeah, and and that's that's the sad part of rural ministry. And that uh, happens in a lot of churches, and the people are happy that their kids have gone on mm -hmm. and bettered themselves, but they also, they're not at home to be at the churches and the restaurants and the, the places that they call home. And, you know, just because they're a rural church, they're not poor. Oh, I, yeah. I call, them, I call them my silently wealthy. I mean, if you ask for it, it, it usually gets gets there. People, even the poor people will give you their shirt off their back. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. It, that type of community. They're all in there to help each other. I, I I can't tell you how, just I've only been there six months and we've done so many special offerings for people in the community, for yeah. flooding and, and disaster, all of that sort of stuff. And people will just give material, financially, their time, everything. Yeah. Our, our Mission 14 did two Rise Against Hunger uh, fundraising events this year. Oh yeah. That, that was awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. We did bake sales. Uh, I mean, it's an unheard of making eighteen hundred dollars off a bake sale. That's unbelievable down here. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Like one of my churches made eight hundred dollars off a soup and sandwich lunch. Yeah, it's just yeah. people. People will give, and people know the food's yeah. good. And and they they don't sell it by the plate. They just ask for donations. Oh, exactly. Just throw money yeah. in the pot. Yeah. Yeah. It it it's a it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually, when somebody passes away, it's a relative and. The church is full. I mean, 
that's probably one of the fullest times that it is. Uh, uh, one of my churches is so small that they regularly have to have the funerals at the funeral home because they just the chat the the, the sanctuary so will not hold all the people who want to come and yeah. be with the family because it's just that or like I've other seen other places where like if this a multi point charge they'll move the funeral to another church because that's just a bigger sanctuary at that other church or bigger yeah. fellowship hall or whatever you need. So that that's basically it. Rural ministry is you know uh-huh. if I had to describe it, it's family. It's family. Uh, oh, that's so true. And I know that, and I know that we've talked before. You say that you almost had a fourth congregation of shut-ins. So how did you manage? That's getting... right. Uh, when I when it came up, our, a lot of I'd say thirty percent of the people were homebound, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't provide for them. So I formed a committee at each church, and I called it an outreach committee. Well, we took the church to them. We, you know, Or Hill did CDs. We took CDs out, made CD players, and took them out to people. Uh, I, I did manuscripts of my sermons. We mailed them and emailed them out. We sent bulletins out, you know, and, and we visited them, sent birthday cards. And we just made them feel like they were part of the church. And we kept visiting them and made people in the church. I didn't have to make them. They just let them know that these people wanted to, to talk and 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 be part of the church and be part of the congregation because that that's what the church is you know fellowship with one another it's not the building it's it's the people oh oh yes and you know the 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 shut-ins they want to be part of it they just can't uh whether it's sickness or age or other things going on in their lives and to be able to organize to take communion to take uh, other things and also to say that you yeah. know you can't get around to each of them every week or even every month sometimes yeah. but if you say hey we're organizing and you'll have two or three people from one or more church go out and visit them once a month they feel yeah. more connected and then if they, you and if they see something that's going on that may need a pastor's visit they'll just call you and say hey maybe you should go by here exactly and and that's that's where we were when i left uh, and forstein uh she does an excellent job. We went to visit one one person in our congregation. Found out that she was a cousin to him. She didn't even know. Him. That's at Forestine's your your colleague. She was your colleague yeah. there, and she stayed well, there while you've been well, well you've been well, reappointed. She, yes. While I was there, she got her license. She's a licensed local pastor now, and that's the reason she could take it over. So. See, I, w- I want to interview on here because before that, she's retired postal worker, right? So she did rural yes, postal yes, work and yes. knew everybody yeah. in that Vale community. I'm everybody, sure. all those shortcuts and everything. Ah, yes. Yeah. So I mean, she she may be on here in the future, y'all. So we may have yeah, a retired postal good. worker turned yeah. pastor on here. Yeah, she's excellent to talk to. She's taken some classes with me too. Yeah, yes, yeah, she has. Mm-hmm. Uh, Goodness, Very yeah. intelligent woman. Uh, but yeah, that's great. Yeah, I love this. I yeah, people like Johnny are what keep me going in terms of going to these little local churches, teaching Methodist studies, rural studies, outreach, how the Book of Discipline works. Because that's one of the things I feel like in our any of our denominations, if we can just really teach the heart of our denomination along with the heart of Christianity, we can see that Methodism can work for us. A lot of rural churches yeah. feel left out of their denominations because they feel like, oh, we we just got thirty five people on a Sunday. No one no one really cares about us. They just want us to send our check to the conference and get a pastor. But if we can make them feel like they're part of a major mission that continues to serve around the world, I think that's what will revive a lot of our smaller churches in the rural spaces. Yes, I agree with you. And and this outreach program, I hate to bring finances up, but you would not believe how much offering comes in from these people to support the church. Oh, yeah. once, Once they know they're part of it and they're you know, they, they know they're part of it. They know they that they, they're going to get it. Yeah. Gifts done. I've seen that happen in churches. Whenever you start really getting the shut-ins involved, checks will come in or they'll hand it to the person who's visited them or they'll have their, you know, their grandchild who comes to church, bring it. Then they'll also like know what's going on in the community. I know who yeah. I can call. That's a shut-in to my church who talks to everybody in that community. If something's going on. Yes. Yeah. They'll call up and say, when you don't bring me, when you don't come get my check. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. And I've seen some churches yeah. switch to because a lot of these rural, uh, especially the older people, don't have Internet in their homes. They don't have a computer. No, no, yeah, they still have yeah. the flip phone. And yeah. so but I've seen churches switch over to doing uh, uh, conference call Bible studies where they can call yeah. in and do Bible study and prayer meeting with people. 
And yeah. that seems like something I've seen churches pick up too. So there's a lot of options yeah. there that I think that, especially with our shut-ins, we can figure out ways to include them. Well, that's one thing that we did at Laura Hill. Uh, Forrest Dean makes a CD of the sermon every week. And we we had these uh, little CD players that we'd take out uh-huh. for people and, and let them see it and borrow yeah. it. And didn't they get it? We'd just pass it on to someone but, someone else yeah and that's uh reaps grove does dvds but we've not we've we're, we're, we're thinking about how the best way to get it out to people and yeah. saying can we get a technology grant to purchase little those portable dvd players exactly that, you can get them for about 85 dollars and just buy, and we probably get a grant from the you can probably get yeah. so if you're listening to this and you're methodist your district probably has grants for technology to help you especially since the pandemic has uh come around we've saw we need to improve our technology and digital presence and one of the realities is a lot of rural spaces do not have regular internet and a lot of your older congregants but a dvd player a cd player a voice recorder there's a lot of different ways to do get people, or like Johnny said, mail out. If you're a manuscript preacher, mail that out. Uh, if you are, uh, send out the newsletter, send out the upper room and the devotion and the and the Sunday school yeah. quarterly. People want to read that. People want to engage in that because that makes them feel like they're part of it. Exactly. And you know they just I mean, like even just seeing the bulletin. I whenever I go visit, I take whatever bulletin that we had if I haven't seen people. And, you know, here's the bulletin. The prayer list is in it. They know what the sermon was about. They can read the scripture. They'll see what's going on in the church. One other thing that they really like is, is I get somebody to videotape the children's church, and I let, let them see the children's church. Oh, oh, yes. yes. I mean, that that's just, that's the sermon in itself. Oh, yeah. Get, making sure, Whether it's children or special music, anything yeah. like that. If your church has yeah. special singing going on, have that recorded. As part of that, ah, oh, yeah. Uh, so, Johnny, thank you for sharing all that. This one of those important reminders is that our communities, and even like what we found is that as we start visiting shut-ins, we find that there are other shut-ins we didn't know about, or that they're maybe they're not members of our church, but they would love a visit. Yeah. And like yeah. then suddenly you've got someone who's part of your community that had never really been, and now your church yeah. has grown. And because one of the things we need to continue to teach is the number of it in attendance on a Sunday morning is not the whole of the life of your church. Yeah, and you need to be connected to the, you know, the EMTs up there in the rural country because you never know when they need you. Hey, somebody's had a car wreck or dying. Would you come and pray for them? Uh, oh yeah, you're you're the, the default chaplain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're 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 it. They want you there. Be a part of community. Connect with the community, fire department, police department. Like you said, the restaurants, even the restaurants. Oh, yeah. Know. I go into the restaurants and yeah. they now know what my drink. I'm the weird one that orders an unsweet tea with no sweetener. So they're like, <laughs> oh, I know what he wants. And he's probably going to want this to eat. Yeah. All right. And then yeah. they'll tell me, hey, did you hear that this happened to somebody? And then it's a church member or a cousin of a church member. Well, I'm like, well, I'll go call them and see what's going on. Yeah. Because the, the, re- the restaurants are the ones who know the gossip, too. Yeah. During harvest season, I always eat breakfast at that restaurant. Uh, that's Northbrook now, but a, a lot of the men go there before church. And when I walk in, they said, well, we got to go. Here comes the pastor. <laughs> so I go to church to them. They don't get to go to church. They out working their fields. <laughs> hey, that's that's a reality. And different seasons bring right. different things. If they're working in the fields, they're working with their yeah. cows, they're working with their orchards and patches. Yeah. I mean, that's I mean that's a reality up there. Like, And even if they're yeah. retired, they're helping a cousin or a family member do something. Yeah, That's and, what happens. Uh, not only football and sports, but they're raising prize cows and showing them all over the United, you know. That. Oh, yeah. And then you've got like barrel racing, rodeo yeah. kids. You've got yeah. 4-H and FFA. Yeah. Uh, it, you, there's always something going on. And it's a mix of the rural and then the things you, you think about, the football, yeah. basketball, those sort of things. Yeah. And you go to the North Carolina State Fair, you, you'll see some of the some of the prize bulls and cows. Come out of Vail, North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. Well, I've got church it. members who show at like the Cleveland County Fair and things like that. Yeah. Their their crafts and their art. Oh, it's it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like my church members have the are the Helms who had the Christmas tree farm. Oh yeah. Uh, so that's I mean that's big in the community. Rural life is vibrant and rich and interconnected, yeah. and we just have to remember that when people aren't there, that doesn't mean they don't like you. That means the cows got out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just that's what true. happened. Yeah, yeah. Or, or it was so cold the car wouldn't start. Those kind of things happen. That was yeah. that was us over Christmas. I had so many church members apologize that they didn't come to Christmas Eve or uh, or Christmas Day service because the pipes burst or the furnace was yeah. frozen. 
I mean, that's what's happened. You're out in the country and it drops to five degrees once every 10 years. And well, some of them came to church just to get warm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, well, mostly they all had family at my church. But if you could, I uh, mean, it's that whole thing. We, we need to open the church up. We can we can t- turn yeah. the heat on. They can sit, at least sit and drink some coffee. Oh, so let's, let's move on to the next part. Thank you, Johnny, for being here. You said you brought a piece of literature to talk about. And uh, based on what you've taken classes with me, I can understand why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, um, Volume one of John Wesley on Christian beliefs. It, it's really a standard sermons written in modern English. I mean, you know, it, it's hard to, you know, look up John Wesley sermons and, and get through that old English. Oh, yeah. So John Wesley, he's writing like he's writing out of the King James Bible or a Shakespeare play because he's from the 1700s. So that's how he wrote. Uh, but like, But now there are people working on uh, translating his sermons into a modern English for people. Now, my exactly. stu- so my students who are listening to this, you will still have to translate his sermons, uh, not translate, you'll still have to outline his sermons in original form because that's what your Board of Ordinate Ministry wants. But oh, get wow. these if you've got church members uh, church members who want to read more of Wesley and engage with that because you find that rural people really resonate with Wesley because he was there for the disenfranchised. Tell me about your experience with this text. Well, uh, I liked it because it, it restructured the sentence structure of it. It, yeah. it put it in modern English. It it also uh, updated the spelling. The spelling. Oh yes. I mean, you know, uh, it, it wasn't the English that we know. <laughs> oh yes, and sometimes I mean they didn't have some standard words, so he might spell words differently depending on what you're reading. Well, yeah, the words are yeah, the meanings of the words are different. Oh yeah, you know? I mean, I used to think about King James, and sometimes heaven means heaven, and sometimes it means sky. <laughs> <laughs> It it's to pull it down. It, it's plain truth for plain people. You know that's the bottom line. Oh and yeah, I, and John Wesley is so powerful. If you and Methodism in general, that's one of the reasons you've had me come teach at your churches because if people learn it, they embrace it and realize, oh, we are exactly. Methodists. We're, We're not, connected. Yeah, We're connected. Yeah. yeah, like rural places are default connected. So like right. just that's how they operate. And now some people in those in our rural communities will want to isolate, and not be part of anything. Yeah. But even if you're just, you know, somebody's neighbor, they know about you and they'll call me and say, hey, my neighbor needs prayers. Can you do this for them? In the small community, we did the uh, missional network. And, and that brought all the churches in our, our community together. And we did that Rise Against Hunger. And that was one of the best things. We got to know each other. We, you know, uh, we connected with one another. And then we went out on uh, one Sunday a month and a pastor from a different church preached we, we brought different people into the church <laughs> all right all right so are you are you so this is my last question for you then we'll wrap up the podcast are you preaching any yet first stanley or are you really just focused on the connectional piece the first day i went in i preached january 1 <laughs> there yeah, you brand, go you, you put, get right into it brand new not, uh, none of this uh, methodist waiting period where you get a couple uh, weeks uh, off in between yeah. no that's like hey. january 1st first day of the year yeah. you're brand new preach the sermon hey i i, I thought it was pretty good had soup and sandwiches I, with the amens group today had uh-huh. 35 people there that, great that's more than I Amen. had. so amens is a men's group it sounds like no it's not a men's group it, it's it's an adult ministry group okay so we meet once a month and go to different places and eat and fellowship together there's something going on if, if it's not scouts it's a basketball team or a volleyball team coming football uh practices out in the front front yard <laughs> You know, we got a big field and they practice there. We got we got five miles of hiking trails on the property. Uh, we got a garden. We have an outside. And when May and the weather comes, we we go outside for uh, morning worship, and then eleven o'clock we have a traditional worship. So it, it it's something for everybody. It, it, we call it common ground. It it's yeah, it's God's. God's place. Yeah, yes, I forgot you had common ground, which is that huge acreage park in the middle of town. Acres. 93, 93 acres, acres in Stanley, North Carolina. Yeah. Is it, and the church uh, operates it, or is it a yes. Okay. yes, we've got a ranger that works on Ranger Gene. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's so great. And when churches do innovative yeah. stuff like that, I didn't even ask you about that, but having that sort of yeah. thing. We're, we're just starting the podcast over again with this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I forgot about you had that beautiful park. Uh, I need to get yeah. out there one day. I'm going to come visit you. We have yeah. lunch, and I'll go out there. We'll, we'll plan oh, yeah. that. We'll you plan that. Let me know ahead of time. I'll fix you a sandwich. 
Excellent. That'll be great. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to close up the podcast. Thank you, Johnny, so much for being here. Um, thank, you spending for time on, thank you for spending time on this podcast. Thank you for sharing what you have. I'm going to put that book in my virtual bookshelf. And thank you for being here on Rusty Water Towers. Where can my guests find you if they want to reach out? Do you have an email or a Facebook they can connect with you on? Uh, jmnorton1950 at gmail.com. Uh, all right, I'll put that in our show notes. Anything else you want to share with people? Uh, God bless. God bless. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap us up then. All right. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get podcasts. If you have questions, suggestions for guest topics, or just want to say hi, I just recently had someone reach out and said they found us when they were Googling stuff about Methodism and, and found me and said that, that my podcast warms their heart, just like John Wesley's heart was strangely warm. So I thank you for that for that review. Uh, you can reach out to us on Instagram, on Facebook, Twitter, and you can email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to my wife, Shannon Lamaster Smith, for our theme music. I report, record and produce this podcast because I have a high hope that we can continue to cultivate life in rural ministry. Thanks for listening. I live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse as you pass. If you weren't trying to find me Many of the trees are dead There's stumps in the ground In a great big yard Across from the fire station Oh